Hello, everyone, and welcome to Crossing Pass Television. I'm Mark Wabazewski, co-hosting today with Don Reed Sr. And I uh, just want to thank you for being on the show. And if any time today you want feel connected or you, you want to you have any questions about what's going on or you, you relate to the story, feel free to give us a call. The number will come on and off the screen at 724-981-7777. And uh, yeah, just uh, feel free to, to reach out to us. So, Amen. Don, why don't Amen. you introduce the guest today? Yeah, you know... Uh... Mark, uh, it's amazing how so many people just uh, in this world have the problems. We've had so many variety of people on this last couple of weeks. We always have different people. But it's so nice to meet someone. Uh, years ago, I've heard about her and her husband or so forth. I, I don't think, did I ever have your husband on my program? Yes, you did. I thought years so. ago. I thought so, years ago, yeah. And he's still in a, you know amazing story here about today we're going to have Michelle Brown. And she's going to share what the Lord has done in her life. And, you know, people, uh, call up somebody. that We need your help. We need your financial help. We need you to tell people about the program. And, and we give away free Bibles here and so forth. But you're going to hear a story today from a pastor's wife. And uh, we hope that now that she'll have to be careful what she says. No, that's not true. But that's why we have people on here. So welcome today, Michelle. God bless you. And tell us where you're born and raised. What happened? Well, you, you made a correct statement. Pastors' wives usually know a lot more than they're allowed to say, and that is true. But <laughs> that's because we're all human, right? Yes. Even yes, pastors. Yes. Um, I was not brought up in a Christian home at all. I, in fact, I was in a, an, an abusive home with an alcoholic father. And um, I, even though that is so, from the time I was very little, I always felt the presence of God. I don't know how to explain that to anybody, but I always felt God was with me through all sorts of things. I, I remember when I was in, uh, I think it was sixth grade, and I remember being in my bed and and I couldn't sleep. I was I was afraid. I was, and I prayed, God, just put a bubble over my bed and keep me safe. I didn't even know what I was saying, but. I always felt God protected me and that, that he was with me. So um, when, I, when I got old enough, my family didn't have any money, and I wanted to be an accountant. So I knew I needed to go to college, and uh, so I went into the Army because at the time there was still a GI Bill and they would help you have money for college. So I went into the Army, which was, you know, that was a pretty scary thing too, but... Um, I, I wanted to go, I wanted to make a better life. I didn't want to be where I was. And when I uh, went into the Army, uh, that's where I met Ron. And at the time, the, I, I was at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and this was in really old wooden buildings, two-story buildings, not in, the, not in the part they had rebuilt and looked pretty. This was the old end of this, the base. And... Uh, the building was full of people who worked in offices and chaplain's assistants, which is what Ron was. And so the chaplain's assistant guys would all come over and play volleyball with the, the girls in the building. They used to call that dating evangelism, by the way. But they, they, we, they would come over and, and play. And um, the, the lady who was across the hall from me was a chaplain's assistant also. She was Jewish. But uh, one day she said to me, oh, Michelle, you know, uh, we're all going to Dairy Queen. Do you, do you want to come? I said, oh, yeah, sure. And he says, well, there's this guy who's going to be there, and um, his name's Ron Brown, but, you know, just take it easy on him. I, I didn't know what that meant. What do you mean, take it easy? I don't know what she thought I was going to do. Anyway, I said, fine. So I sat, and he sat across, directly across from me, and the whole time he just had this huge grin on his face. And he only said, like, two things to me, and they were both puns. I said, I don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what to think of this guy. But um, hanging around those people, you know, I, there was obviously, they, were, they, were, they had fun together. They were good to each other. It was just a nice place to be. Well, Ron decided to take me to McDonald's because we, we were little soldiers, no money. So he took me to McDonald's, and um, he was going to witness to me. So he starts talking about it, and I said, I don't really see the point, because God's been with me the whole time, so I don't know why I'm worried about Jesus, I mean. And he said, you know, 
that's exactly what the devil wants you to think. And my mind went, <gasps> and I said, three days, that's all that I heard in my mind was, that's just what the devil wants you to think. That's just what the devil wants you to think. And in about three days after all of that, I kneeled by my bed in my, my little room, and I, I asked Jesus into my life. Well, there was no thunderclap. I didn't break out into tongues. There was no angels flying around the room or any of that. But I knew that I knew that I knew that I had made that choice and that that was true. And the first person that I told when I came out was Ron. And he was so excited. And so he got me into some Bible study groups and brought me into the fold of those people, and that was the beginnings of my Christianity. So I became a Christian literally when I was 19 or 18. Wow. So I didn't have any of that background. Um, but And then when we were, um, I, once I, I actually was engaged to someone else at the time. It was kind of a rescue engagement. We were kind of engaged to each other to protect each other from the, the world. But, <laughs> Um, uh, then after that engagement broke up, he found somebody else, which was a great thing for him. He, he deserved to be with someone who was really for him. And um, we started dating. We dated for 10 weeks. We got engaged for 10 weeks. We don't believe in doing anything long. You know, <laughs> once we make a decision, it's done, we're on. You know, we go. And uh, so we, uh, we got married. And uh, shortly thereafter, we decided, well, you know what? Let's have kids while we're young so we can have fun with them. So we didn't wait for that either. So yeah, we got started. Um, once we got out of the Army, it took us a few years, but I, got, I finally got to go to school. And we literally, Ron and I were both in school full time at the same time with two kids preschool age, and he worked a part time job. And we pulled all that together. And even with all that, we were able to only have sitters for our kids in our senior year because that was important to us. We didn't want other people raising our children. And so we, you know, that's, that's the beginnings of all that. But the story I want to tell today, I have a, one super story because we've been, we've been together and we've been in ministry for many, many years. And uh, so we have tons of stories, but this one is the one I wanted to share today. Um, I was having um, some physical problems and I was in the hospital. And I don't know about anybody else, but I hate being in the hospital. I've never been treated badly, but I, it just feels very sanitary and very inhumane, cold. And um, so I was there and I was kind of feeling super sorry for myself because I was in the hospital. And there was a Gideon Bible in the drawer so I opened the Gideon Bible and, and did what they call that Bible bingo, you know, flip the Bible open to wherever it opens to. And I read Hebrews 2. Now, I'm not going to go to the very beginning, but the first part of the chapter just talks about who Jesus is and the power that he has and how he's set up. And then it came to Hebrews 2.10. And uh, if you permit me to read this. Um, it says... For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, from which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren." saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted." And the thing that got me was I always, even though I was saved and I believe God was with me all the time, I always had this feeling like he was putting up with me because I wasn't good enough, you know? Mm -hmm. Like he was always kind of like, 
yeah, Michelle, I just wish you were a little better, but I love you anyway. So when I read that and it said, both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father, from which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. It was like, oh, he doesn't look at me like a rescue thing. He looks at me like a sister, like family, like, like love of a family. Like instead of rescuing me, he's restoring me to what he knows is his heart that I can be. And that and he loves me past all of that stuff. That stuff's not important to him. What's important is for me to be restored and be full and be with him. And it just blew my oh, little wow. spiritual mind right off the <laughs> chart. Because I was just like, wow. <laughs> and all this time I knew, you know, he cared about me, but he loves me. He, he loves me. Be, whatever I did, whatever <clears throat> I haven't done, whatever I do, he loves me. And that thing he wants to do is make me better. Take me to where he can take me. Make me full. And, and I think in a way that makes it easier. We deal with all kinds of people. But I, I think part of it, the reason we can is because we know that God loves everybody and his job is to restore us. Mm -hmm. And to bring us to him, to him. Yeah, yeah. And so, he know, and it's it's amazing that he came a man, so he's able to relate to us on that way. Right. That he experienced right. those same temptations, those, a lot of the same trials that we go through. He's aware of it. Right. It's interesting, you know. It says that makes him merciful in that in that role that he has in our yes. lives now. So yes. That's amazing. Well, we'll get back to that. But first, we're going to go to something to think about with okay. uh, Don. He's going to talk about spiritual exercise. So check out this uh, spiritual exercise with Don Reed. Hi there. Can you imagine sometimes how, as we get older, we get away from doing the physical exercising in our body? You know what happens to it, many of us. And when we become a Christian, then we've got to uh, spiritual exercise our mind, our body, our brain, and everything you can think of it. So I'm going to show you today what at least it worked for me and so forth, because maybe I had an advantage of a lot of other people. But when you read the Bible here, when I first got saved, I knew nothing, absolutely nothing about it. Even though I went to Westminster College and uh, on a, a scholarship and uh, we played basketball in Madison Square Garden, I was physically pretty good. I had a tribe out with the Pickard Pirates and all this physical uh, time was, was really good time. But now I become a Christian, I've got to have a learn the spiritual word of God and I've got to exercise my mind and I've got to memorize scripture. So I'm just going to give you a few clues I use doing it. Don't forget, I will say this too, I have owned a CPA accounting firm. I started with 3,000 clients, 22 employees I have today. And uh, so I've been exercising my spiritual uh, abilities in front of all my employees. But you have to start first by the word of God and being born again, according to John 3.3. 3. So the first thing God taught me when I was coming out of the Las Vegas lifestyle, drinking, gambling, and whatever you want to call it, people, I had to start memorizing scripture. Now I could quote the uh, tax laws pretty good, so God taught me, and I did this, and I'm gonna show you, and I'm not showing you bragging, but it worked out for me. So I memorized all the books in the Old Testament and the New, and I'm gonna go through them and let you see uh, if I couldn't sleep at night, I would start uh, quoting scripture. Now, I always say, if you can't sleep at night, the first thing to do is go get your Ten Commandments if you're young and start memorizing the Ten Commandments, frontwards and backwards. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, number, Deuteronomy is in the first five books of the Bible. Or you can go to all the, thou shalt have no other God before, and thou shalt not worship any grave enemies, thou shalt not use the name of God's in vain. All right, to keep the Sabbath, honor your father and mother, thou shalt not kill, commit adultery, steal, lie. And uh, commit adultery, steal, lie, and, and uh, the tenth one was the covet. Now, I learned them and I memorized them just like I'm doing this with this, my, my legs and keeping shape in here today. And if you can do it, I don't care how old you are. Then I turn around and I memorized every book in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I couldn't fall asleep one night. So I want to go through and show you 
what I did and it might help you. Now, not that I'm trying to show off people, but you have to get into memorizing scripture. Jesus quoted scripture. On the fourth chapter of Matthew, he went out into the world under the desert. You remember the story on that? Well, that's the way it is with you. You're fighting something you cannot see. It's a spiritual warfare, warfare going on inside of you. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Song, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Song, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Zechariah, Malachi. Okay, now. I said them, and I would still repeat them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. I did this because I was fighting the spiritual battle of the flesh. But I still have to keep up with the flesh, what I'm doing now, swimming or doing whatever you want. Pick up your Bible. Try memorizing one scripture a day. Take Proverbs, for instance. There's 31 chapters in Proverbs. So if you read one proverb a day, memorize one proverb, you could do the same thing. Every day, memorize one proverb, and now we call it the calendar of the Bible. Think of this now, people. If you're exercising your body, you've got to exercise your spirit. Please, just take time to take care of your body physically, but you have to be born spiritually first before you can know spiritually what God is trying to tell you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn, for that message. All right, Michelle, let's, let's get back into where you, you were. So you were at the hospital, which you didn't like to be there. Obviously, right. who does? And right. you do the, the Bible bingo, Bible roulette. That verse just really impacts you. <laughs> right. Um, so what happens next? Well, I did a lot of bawling. I called my husband. I don't think I had a phone then. When you came to visit, I told him about it. But it just added to my whole concept of, of it, it made God di not different exactly, but it added a whole another piece to our relationship. It, it made me a lot more comfortable in, in praying to God and speaking to God and, and really feeling like he... He knew where I was, and he, and he was okay. You know, there's a thing that says, you know, God um, uh, loves us where we are, but he doesn't leave us where we are. Amen. You know, and so I, I understood that he was okay with where I am, and he wanted to move me on. You know, yeah. Michelle, when, I, when I'm listening to your testimony, I, I, uh, believe it or not, people like you on your testimony that didn't have any drive, and you said some background was your father was drinking and all that, but you never came from a drugs and alcohol and so forth. Right. We have calls sometimes from people, and I just want to show this to encourage you how your testimony can touch as many people as a drunk or something, because most people aren't drunks out there, or right. drugs, right? Right. But when I asked one guy to be on television, he said, Don, I didn't, he was a pastor, I didn't have a testimony. He said, I, I don't really, should. you know, I said, I said, that don't matter. He said, you have a testimony if you didn't do some of these things. Well, he called me back on a Monday. He said, boy, you did it. You put me under condemnation. You know, right. And he gave his testimony. When we get calls from people like that, where the lady asked me to speak in a Presbyterian church down in Pulaski, and she got saved after she called. I went down there and filled in for a, a pastor that didn't even know me, okay? I went down and preached down there, and she ended up getting saved, sitting in the church and, and knowing. But when you got saved, then did the Bible really become a real now, right? It, the yeah. reality, uh, the word, right? Well, I didn't really even have, up to that point, I didn't even have the word. Right. Up to that point, I only had, you know, little sprinkles here and there. Now, when I was very young, for a few years, my mom and dad sent me to church, sent us to church. But, you know, if your parents don't go with you, it makes a big difference. Right. And, and uh, you know, so, you know, we used to, you know, skip out on church and eat candy in the back of the church. And I went to Sunday school and I loved the singing, but I really didn't get it, you know. But I honestly believe that God protected me for a few reasons, for my own self, but also for Ron, for my husband, because God puts together teams. Mm -hmm. He, he, he takes people, and, and for me, being a person who was from Connecticut and him being a person from Pennsylvania, how do you get those two people even in the same vicinity? <laughs> and then we were on a base together, and the base has thousands of people. 
to get those two people now also together in a, a bigger environment, it's, it's pretty amazing. And then you talk about um, people having testimonies and people thinking because they didn't get in big trouble and it isn't sensational that it isn't a testimony, and, and I'm just going to share a funny. Ron, Ron's talked about this when he's given speeches, and his one of his favorites is that when he was a young boy, he was in a car seat, and they put it on the top of the car, and they drove off, and his car seat hit the side of the road, and uh, he was saved by wolves and raised by wolves for a period of time <laughs> because of the fact that people think, you know, you get to the feeling that people don't believe that it's a big deal unless there's something horrible before it. That's it. Yeah. And, and that's not true. To, to, to be saved is just as big a deal for the person that sits in a pew all their life as it is for the person who comes out of the gutter sure. and comes out of the thing. It's the same salvation, and it's the same need. Yeah, you, you said you, you, felt like, need. you said you felt like you had that, that disconnect from God a little, that you weren't good enough, right. you know? So whether, and yeah, you might not be stuck in the drugs or anything else, but there's a lot of people out there who probably maybe raised Christian, maybe not, but they still feel that, that distance between them and God. Right. And there's something wrong with them and they're not good enough. Right. And that's why it's important to know God will meet you where you're at and he loves you where you're at. And sometimes yeah. I think some of the things we do in churches kind of support that concept that there's this big separation. And that's one of the things that the body of Christ needs to get over is there is no separation if you are a saved person, there is no separation between you and God. There is no big hill you have to climb to speak to him. There's no special language you have to use. It's just not there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, people underestimate the power of the blood, like what that really meant. Like right. he really did right. take our sins. They're not ours. He took them. We gave them to him. And now we're in right standing with God, and we can come to him boldly in confidence. So. And I, yeah. and I, I, I wanted to share, this is one of my very, I, I have a lot of verses in my life, but this is one of my uh, long-standing verses. It's 2 Timothy 1.12. And it says, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. We, we are totally safe with God. Wow. We are totally safe. He's taking care of us. We don't have to think, oh my gosh, I had a bad day. I yelled at my kids. It's over. No. We are safe with God. We've entrusted our spirit to him, and he is holding it, and we'll keep it safe. Wow. You know, when you take your testimony, it's so different. Just think, but some people think that they have, a, have emotion. They don't feel nothing. Right? Right. Believe me, you're not saved on feelings. No. You know, feelings will go away eventually. You better get saved on faith. And faith only. Faith in who? Not your church, not your right. pastor, right? Right. Not your parents, not your husband, not your wife. Faith in the cross. Right. The cross of Jesus Christ. If we just get back to the cross and realize today there's so many denominations out there. So many people say, you've got to do this. You've got to believe that way. The rapture now, the rapture in the middle, the rapture in the end. What difference does it matter? You get into the Word of God. Right. And God, you're into the Word now, right? Yes. And there's only literally, if you think about it, there's very few what I call core beliefs of Christianity. And, and there's so many denominations and so many different flicky things going on. But really, there's very few absolute core beliefs that determine what Christianity is. And I think if you keep your thoughts and your heart in those those core beliefs, then you can have fellowship with anybody from any denomination, and you can sit in any church, and you can understand where they are, and you can have fellowship with all sorts of different people instead of being limited to, oh, I can only speak to mm -hmm. these people because this is what you're supposed to believe. Well, yeah. There's no it's such a thing as a, as a lone arranger. Well, right. one, one thing I thought of when you said that was someone came to Jesus and they said, which of the commandments is the greatest? He said the greatest is love God with all your heart, soul, and might. And he said the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself or love one another as I've loved you. So basically he's saying like it's love. Love for God, love for one another. Let it be sincere. In right. this holds all the law of the prophets, right? So right. like this book can be very confusing. But Jesus pretty much said like it's summed up in like a real love. 
you know, like a real love for God and for one another. That's, that's not always the easiest thing to do in our fallen nature, but it is simple. You know? Now, if you're out there today, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt what? Be saved, right? Not shaved. Right. Get as close as you can. No? Now, if you believe that, so with the heart man believe it, was a mouth confession is made. So go tell somebody about Jesus. If you are, if you can't tell about Jesus, you can't talk about Jesus. You can talk about the Steelers. I don't want to hear about that. I want to hear about <laughs> Jesus when I'm with you. And that's what it's all about. That's what Crossing Paths is all about. She, I called her up and asked her if she'd be on TV. And she said, oh, no, my schedule. So, yes. That's what she said. Yes. When? And how are you out there today? You know, we have Bibles we give away. We, if you want a Bible, call our ministry. We have uh, telephone number 724-981-7777. If you want to call that night, that number, the webpage is crossingpast.org. Every program that we've had is on the webpage. We are here because God brought us here, and it's for a reason we're crossing paths here today with my brother and my sister. So please... Send us a letter. Tell us you're enjoying the program. If you would join our, our seven, uh, $70, $77 a year uh, one-time gift club, we'd appreciate that. Keep us on the television, in your air, across the country. Remember, God loves you, just like she said. It's amazing how I love testimonies of somebody didn't drink, gamble, alcohol, but God loves her. She was lost as I was lost. That's right. She was lost as I was lost. Right. But today... We're brothers and sisters in Christ. I had one more thing, please. I have a, first I want to say, if you're, if you are not talking to Jesus Christ and don't have Jesus in your life, I'm telling you, he, all he wants is to make your life better, mm -hmm. to bring you to a place of peace, to bring you a place of belonging. And I have a quote that's from Henry Ward Beecher. It says, God pardons like a mother who kisses away the repentant tears of her child. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm in my backyard here, and people have been asking me about Crossing Pass books, and we found a couple of these in our inventory, Crossing Pass Treasure, uh, Volume 1, and it is various people in their lives that appeared on our television program, and some of them are very interesting. They're all interesting, but I want to tell you some of them if you would like to get this book, okay? Uh, we have a Jewish lady that be, was converted, okay? We have a, uh, a, a pastor from the Nazarene Church who got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he's in here too. And we have, uh, my wife, is uh, Joyce here, is a uh, story of her life is in here, and my particular short story of life is my in, in here too. So for $15, you could send us or anything additional top that would help us to keep us on the air. God bless you and thank you.